What's happening, everybody? Welcome into a brand new episode of Crossed Up. I'm Bob Wankel. Anthony Sanfilippo's here. It's Friday, September 8th. Philly's coming back home after a 3-3 three and three road trip uh, against Milwaukee and San Diego. Won three of their final four games to kind of salvage a road trip that, that got off to a very rocky start, Anthony. Now they come home and they, they play a Marlins team that's just one half game out of the final wild card spot. Uh, they are hanging around. You know, it felt like it felt like Miami sort of f- fell out of this thing, and, and they're still here. They're still doing it. And then they certainly have a, a big series next week with the Braves. Uh, and, you know, hopefully they they send a message in that series. It's going to be an opportunity to kind of let them know, hey, guess, guess what's coming here in three, four weeks out. So it was um, – it was like – for me, it was a road trip that happened. It was – it's kind of what you expected. Like I, if you would have asked me a week ago, what are they going to do? I would have said three and three. I'd love to see four and two, but probably going to be a 500 road trip. They're only 16 and 19 against NL East teams this season. Is this, is this like homestand important for like, yeah, I guess like you can accomplish a few things. You can deliver the knockout blow. Or you can really hurt the Marlins chances. You can send a message to the Braves. Like, where where are you at? Like, I, I don't really, I'll be honest with you, I just don't have that much juice right now. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, and that's fair, uh, Bob. I, I, I look at it and I say, the, the weekend went exactly as I thought it would go as far as outcomes. Uh, I, I thought they would lose two of three to Milwaukee, and I thought they would win two of three against San Diego, and that's exactly what they did. Um, I, some of the games were probably perplexing in the way that they went. Like, I was a little, little surprised um, that, they coughed up, you know, the way they coughed up a couple of those games in Milwaukee. Uh, I was surprised that they were so listless in a bullpen game against the Padres, but I was equally surprised that they hit Waka as well as they did because Waka has been pitching well mm-hmm. I mean, to his credit. Right. Um, so, I th- so I thought that there were some surprises and I was surprised that they hit the Brewers bullpen because um, we talked about how good the Brewers pitching is and it's no joke. I mean, if you look at their numbers all year, it's been great. And even though the Phillies lost two or three, they put up runs in those games. I mean, so they they hit what everybody would say. Well, you know, you don't want to play the Brewers. And, you know, I even said it. I said of all the teams that they could match up with in a three-game series, the one I wanted to see the least is the Brewers because of their pitching. And then after that series, I was like, oh, well, maybe they can hit this pitching staff, right? So so there were, there were surprising signs from a positive end of things and surprising signs on the negative side. But in the end, the outcome was exactly as I thought. Um, the, the, the Marlins... All right, this series is interesting to me because I think it's going to mean a lot more to the Marlins than it's going to mean to the Phillies. Because the Phillies, I think the they're gearing up for the Braves. I think the Braves is going to be a series that they want to make a statement in. Like, you have gone out and bludgeoned every team you've played in every big series. You're not coming in here and doing it. I think that's going to be their message and that, that they're going to want to – send whether they actually do or not we'll, we'll see but i think that there's a risk that this series this weekend against the marlins is kind of a look look ahead series and they get maybe they end up losing two of three because the marlins are in that more desperate situation trying to get that last playoff spot not to say that that's a that's an acceptable outcome if it if it is what it is but i think it's it's a possible outcome and maybe even more over closer to likely than it is unlikely so there are a few things i want to get to and let's just start with the marlins because i feel like a lot of times we do the the look ahead thing at the very end of the show yeah but i kind of want to start in the in the present with the most immediate thing and and so tonight you're going to see yuri perez for miami who's been really promising this season um he has struggled a little bit lately the phillies go with christopher sanchez and and this is kind of where i want to start today so christopher sanchez has had a, a a pretty good season and you see him come up when, when it's his turn in the rotation you look at the probable pitchers you say okay they got sanchez going tonight when i ask you hey and i like maybe one or two words here christopher sanchez is throwing tonight how do you feel about it what's your response to that okay you feel okay about it like yeah. he's going to give you a chance or yeah. he's going to compete for for five or six innings so yeah he, he know, might and he might be better than that but yeah. Give me an opportunity to win the game. Yeah. Let me just ask you this, and, and I'll throw out some numbers as I ask you this. Why isn't he receiving more hype 
than, than what he's getting. And you might have an obvious answer to it, but just for some context here, he was recalled on June 17th. So among all National League pitchers that have made at least 12 starts since June 17th, only Freddie Peralta and Zach Wheeler have a better whip than him. It's better than guys like Spencer Strider, Corbin Burns, Logan Webb, Zach Galen. He has the second lowest walk to strikeout ratio. Like he has a 3-3-1 ERA. Opponents are only hitting 228 against him. Those are both top 10 numbers amongst National League starters. Why in a city where hype, and like I wrote this today, in a city where where we overreact and hype everything, you have this young 24-year-old kid who's been one of the best pitchers in the National League for 3 months and you you go, "Eh, yeah, I feel I feel pretty good about him, but not really." Like, so what's the deal here? Well, I think because you don't you don't want to you got to pump the brakes right because he's putting up numbers that are not too different a little bit better but not too different than what Bailey Falter gave you last year at this time of year right I mean you know so let's yeah we were it's literally all talking- what I wrote it's literally <laughs> what I wrote in this newsletter today <laughs> I said I think that we have some PTSD from Bailey Falter who was then a year later traded for a guy that's hitting 095 for the Phillies yeah exactly I mean not only that, I mean, if you look at, you know, Sanchez is also pushing, you know, he's, I know he's only thrown 75 innings at the big league level, but if you combine what he's done at the minor league level, this he's, he's hitting a point where he's throwing more innings than he's ever thrown uh, in a season. Um, and his last few starts, while they haven't been terrible starts, eh, they've not been the greatest. Let's just put it that way, right? I mean... You know, I thought that maybe the start against Washington was he a little lucky. Um, he did give up seven hits in six innings, only the two earned runs. Um, but that was also because he th- uh, was that the one where he had the throwing error um, yeah. that ended up saving him a couple of earned runs, right? So, so that was you had that one. The game against St. Louis was fine, um, but then the 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 Angels start. Um, Oh no, maybe that was the one that he had the. Oh, the game. angel start. Yeah, it was it the was angel start. Yeah, yeah, it was the, the final game. Uh, of yeah. The angel series. Yeah. Yeah, that one. What he only went four and two thirds in that one. Angels it was five earned runs. Then an inning later, they changed it, was, it to a throwing error, and they knocked yeah. it to three earned runs. Yeah, yeah, knocked it to three. Yeah, so like that one was. So like two of his last three starts have been meh, and so it's like okay, let, let's see if he can get back to what he was doing when he was in July, right? When he right. was really good. Um. So you know, it, it'll be an opportunity, you know, for him. I I think that there is a there is still a world where he could be a game four starter in the playoffs. Um, I, I don't think I still think he's less likely to be that and more likely to be the bulk inning reliever in maybe a piggyback situation. Um, but I but I think that there's 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 an actual competition for that here down the stretch, and and. Christopher Sanchez can possibly steal it. It depends on if the Phillies really want to go with two lefties in a, in a five game series, right? Against the Braves. Do you, do you want to do that? Do you think that that helps you? You can keep in mind some of those best hitters in Atlanta are right-handed hitters. Um, I know Olsen is the lefty, the big lefty, but I mean, Acuna is right-handed and Riley's right-handed. Albies is a switch hitter. I mean, I, I don't, there, I don't necessarily know if there's an advantage to throwing lefties against them. So that, yeah, that, I, think, that uh, I remember a few weeks back, I remember uh, saying, well, okay, what's their, their team OPS against lefties versus righties. And I said, Oh, well, look, it's, they're both astronomical. I mean, yeah. they're, they're off the charts against, against everyone. Yeah. You know what I, I find to be a little bit uh, unsettling though, right now is we're still talking about what do you do with a, a number three, number four, number five, not number five, but number four spot in a playoff rotation. Like there really hasn't been, anything that's happened here over the past couple of weeks, because I think we've been asking ourselves this question since Michael Lorenzen came in and threw the no hitter, we said, Oh, okay. Wow. You know, Tywon Walker's winning all these games, but he struggles in the first inning and he's been kind of unimpressive. Ranger Suarez. We don't know exactly where he's going to be at. Aaron Nola has been a, a bit of a mess, you know, and, and Christopher Sanchez is kind of plugging along doing a nice job, but do you really feel comfortable giving him the ball? And, you know, here we are two, three weeks later, and we're still kind of asking ourselves the same questions. Uh, this is something that has to get figured out over the next couple of weeks here. Yeah, I guess I guess so in part. Um, uh, but I guess the other thing, if I'm looking for looking for from an optimistic p- point of view, is the fact that you have six guys 
gives you the flexibility to be more uh to have a quicker trigger yeah on, like, pulling, on pulling a guy because you have guy someone who doesn't have it in the game. yeah like yeah like, like, i just look at it and go like it's great that they have six guys but i only feel really good about one of them right now like yeah i get like, it i, I, and, I certainly and get that you know, I, I understand that you can throw really well for the next three weeks, and that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to come out, get the ball in the playoffs, and do a good job. But, like, man, like, they're not really giving you a lot to feel good about. I actually thought that Lorenzen the other night was a little bit better than the final line indicated. Things sort of fell apart at the end. Uh, you know, Bryson Stott didn't help him with that throw to the plate. Uh, that was yeah. a poor decision, not a good throw. You know, I mean, I get all that, but – you know, I, I'm I, I'm looking for him now to kind of revert back to the guy that he was for most of the season with the Tigers, and he hasn't been that the last four times out now. Tywan Walker the other night getting that eight one lead. Uh, I say the other night. I guess it was Monday night now, but that that to me was ultra concerning. Of, of all the starts that he's had, where you've said like, oh man, bad first inning, he sort of stabilizes, he ends up going five six innings, gives up three four runs, whatever. That was that was very disappointing to me the other night. He yeah. turned that into a game that didn't need to be a game against a team that has been notorious for just rolling over this season when they get behind. That team has no heart, and he let them back in it. And I know that he went to Twitter or X or whatever after the game, and he tweeted out, like, hey, Philadelphia, like, I got to be better, and, like, I will be better, and that's awesome. But, I mean, we're really looking at a situation here where this guy could win 16, 17 games for them, and I don't even know how the hell you roster him in the playoffs right now. That's a great, it's a great question. Um, I, I, look, I, the, I think what this ultimately comes down to, Bob, is if the Phillies are going to succeed in the postseason, and I'm, what I mean by succeed is beyond the wild card, because if they lose the wild card, we're all, the entire city is going to be disappointed. It's going to be considered a disappointment and a, and a failed season. Even though you got in, you can't lose in the uh, opening round of the of the playoffs in a three game series, which I still believe will be here against the Cubs. Um, but even if it's flipped and it's in Wrigley, you you can't win. I mean, you can't have a successful season without winning that series for sure. Um, but if they're really going to be successful and and beat the Braves again, it comes down to Aaron Nola being a better starter. Because I, I can look at it and say, all right, if Zach Wheeler is Zach Wheeler and Aaron Nola can pitch to the level we know he can pitch at but hasn't really done with any consistency this season, I can go through games three and four and say lefty-righty piggybacks. Suarez and Walker and Sanchez and um, uh, Lorenzen or vice versa. Suarez and Lorenzen, Sanchez and Walker, however you want to do it. Like I can look at that and say you can you can screw with the lineup a little bit by having opposite handed pitchers who are going to pitch three innings apiece in those games. And then you get to your back into your bullpen like that works for me against yeah. them. But it's but it's incumbent upon Nola being able to give you at least one really good start against the Braves, and depending on how how the 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 playoffs fall and where your rotation is at that point, potentially two games in that series. So so really really comes down that's what it comes down to to me for the most Bob, and it really is going to be Aaron Nola is the one that makes the makes or breaks the Phillies postseason pitching rotation. Yeah, I think that there's there's no question about it. One of the things that I, I wanted to touch on here is I was going to ask you, you know, what is one thing or or who is one player that you want to see between now and the end of this season give you something? Like, what, what do you need to see? Like, what's the most important thing for you to see? And it's, it's interesting. I think that Aaron Nola is probably going to be the answer to that question for most people. It's just the lack of consistency. I know we talked a lot about this on Monday, and I don't want to spend too much time on it today, but it's really that lack of consistency. Like when you look at Aaron Nola, what you think about is like, I'm going to get a quality start. Like I'm going to get innings. He's not getting deep into games right now. And that I know, reasonably speaking, that he's going to give me a shot to win games. And, you know, he has not this season. Like I just went through it today. I looked at his game log. He has not put together three consecutive starts this season where he's given up three runs or fewer. Like he hasn't even done three, three, three across three starts. Yeah. There's always been a four or five that quickly mixes in there. And it's, it's, you know, we've, we've beaten this topic into the ground, but like, would I feel a lot better if Aaron Nola with four, maybe five starts, if he has to left in this season, 
if, if he could give me that type of consistency, like, yes, I'd feel infinitely better come next month. You know, here's the thing, though, Bob, and, and we talked about this last time, too, and this is why Aaron Nola is not my answer, because they're not lining him up against anybody. Great. I mean, yeah, he's going to pitch against the Marlins this weekend, but he's not going to pitch against the Braves. Right. At least right now, it doesn't look like he is. Um, it looks like he's going to, he's going to, you know, do the Marlins and then, um, who do they have in between St. Louis? That, so it'd be Marlins, St. Louis, Mets, Pirates would be his four remaining starts. Right. You're not talking about playing against like a bunch of world beating offenses there, right? Well, no, I mean, they, go, they go Marlins Braves here. So they, they go, no, no, Marlins- but he's not pitching in the Brave series. Okay. So at how, at are least- away with, how are they going to get away with that though? With, with. You know, he, they, they go double header Monday, and then they have three more with it. So the, two more with Atlanta beyond that. So how are they? The, just ske- like- the schedule right now for pitching, and and it, I could again, I, it, this could change, but you have Sanchez tonight, right? Okay. Then you have Nola sat tomorrow, and then you have Suarez on Sunday. That's the Marlins okay. series. Then the Braves double header on Monday. Right, 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 right. Walker Lorenzen. Then you have Wheeler on Tuesday, and then you have Sanchez on Wednesday. Got so it. Nola does not yeah, pitch here. Right. Yeah. Right? Yeah, he'll, so go, it, he'll go against the Cardinals on Friday. Yeah, so he'll go yeah. in St. Louis instead. And then if he's pitching that, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, I mean, I guess technically he could potentially throw that Wednesday game in Atlanta, but it depends on where well, you're – Let's talk about that, regardless yeah. of what the Phillies decide to do, because we could show up down there tonight and they could say, hey, we're going to we're gonna switch things around and do this. But, like – is there value in Aaron Nola getting the ball against the Braves either next week in Philadelphia or when they see them in Atlanta later this month? Like, would you want him to take the ball against the Braves? And, you know, is the is the potential reward of what? Him going out and throwing six, seven innings and dominating that team? Like, is that going to help him, do you think? Or, you know, do you run the risk of him going out there, blowing up, and then now you feel like now not only – now, not only has he not pitched well all year, but the one thing that he could probably talk himself into is I always throw the ball well against the Braves, which is true. He's And he had a really good start, six innings shutout against them earlier this year. But, like, do you almost just say, like, let's protect that? Like, let's protect the idea that Aaron believes that he can go out and get this lineup and maybe not expose him to the, the potential of getting his head beaten in. I mean, I, well, I can't believe this is the conversation we're having, but it feels like – and whether this is fair or not, like it certainly feels like all of these things sort of matter to him. So, yeah, no, I, and it's a good question, Bob. But I, he, what I was the point I was going to make on this whole thing, and I, you know, I'm, I, I do take a little bit of a circuitous route, so I apologize for doing that. But is is that he could pitch great in these last four starts? He could give you classic Aaron Nola and go out there and throw seven innings, eight innings, and, you know, give up one, two runs and really look like the guy that you want him to look like. I don't think that that changes the calculus of what he is in the playoffs. He could be poor in these next four starts, and I don't think that changes the calculus of what he is in the playoffs. Come playoff time, it's going to be you're going to get either good Nola or bad Nola. You're going to get one or the other. And and I don't think that these four games will dictate one way or the other what you're going to see in October. So, so that's really, to me, that's why he's not the most important thing okay, that I so want to see in September. Okay, so if not Nola, then who or what? What I want to see, and I, it's going to be like, really? This is the guy that you want to see? <laughs> is it, is it I, Rodolfo Castro? No, yeah, <laughs> you got it. How did you know? Uh, I want to see Gregory Soto freaking fill the zone with his stuff and just put guys away. All right. I, I, I'm a, we've had this conversation on, on Kimbrell and Alvarado and I'm bullish on those two. I do think that they're going to be both going to be fine because they're still throwing. They're still hitting. I mean, Alvarado was hitting one Oh one on a couple of his pitches. Yeah. He was a little wild, but I think it's just a matter. That's a matter of overthrowing. You just kind of rein that in a little bit. And yeah, and I think he did a nice job, even though he walked those first two guys of getting out of that inning in San Diego. I thought he was great after that. Um, Kimbrell, sometimes in the last couple of outings, he's had a little bit of lack of confidence, I think, in the curveball. But even there were a couple times where he got used the curveball and got big outs. So it's kind of like it's just a matter of getting back, getting the confidence in that pitch back. Like I think that those two guys will be fine. We saw some good signs from Dominguez, especially in Milwaukee, really had a couple of nice innings. And so, like, okay, 
that that could continue. I do want to keep an eye on it, but I think that you know maybe he's starting to round into form. Okay, good. You need the fourth guy out there because who's the fourth? Who's the other lefty? It's not going to be Matt Strom, right? It's not. And and Suarez so do you feel is better? Like, do you feel right now? Playoff start tonight. It's it's game one of a, a postseason series, and you've got. Uh, you know, two outs in the seventh, and there's a runner on second, and you're you're holding a one run lead, and you've got to go to a lefty. It it is still Soto. Oh, like, who else is it? You know, who else is it? I mean, may, it could be Alvarado in the moment. I mean, it, it, you know, I you got to I got. I guess I'm just thinking like the, I'm trying. I know they'll mix and match, and I know that they yeah. don't designate innings to certain guys, but like I'm thinking in my mind, like you probably have him in the eighth. But yeah. Yeah. Okay, so if you look at, at Gregory Soto, I mean, the numbers are are pretty ugly. Like, you, you watch him come into a game, and for the most part, most of this season, I said to myself, like, I feel pretty good with Gregory Soto in the game. I do. Like, I you talk about the live arm, the velocity, the whole thing. And I go, okay, like, this is a guy that, like, I, I think I trust. Over the last couple of weeks, though, I've, I've moved to this place where I'm like, I, I don't trust him and i mean like over the last 30 days dude like he's got an 1105 era opponents are hitting 276 to get against them it's it's seven seven and a third innings he's only thrown seven and a third innings in the last 30 days he's given up eight hits in those seven and a third with four walks like and he's given up a ton of runs like, it's not like he's overworked like when you look at it through that lens like he hasn't thrown since monday i think since august 30th the last what's that 10 days, including today, he's only had three appearances. So like, you can't tell me that he's fatigued. It's, it's not like that they're running him out there every other night. I, I, I don't know. Like I, I'm with you that you need to see it from him and that he has the capability of doing it. But he has been uh, really concerning here lately. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I never, I never look at ERA really for relievers. I, I know it's, it's, it that was a, that's a nice stat to throw out there, like to say, hey, he's not been great. Well, no, because he hasn't. But he, usually, because relievers are shorter innings, obviously, yeah, like, you know, yeah, one, I, I know he put together a run. He had like a blow up against. I think it was like maybe I looked at it this morning. The Twins, Minnesota, I think he had a blow up. Yeah. yeah, and then like, yeah, he went like through two weeks where yeah, he was he was pretty decent, but then yeah, and then. Like, Last three appearances, his, it's like, what is this? Not been good. Two of the last three have not been good. Right. And that's a so that's the thing. Like, I think that we've seen um it, you know, since that twins game, uh, a lot of inconsistency. So it's almost a month, it's three weeks, but we've seen a lot of inconsistency from him. And that's where I that's where I go, okay, I need to see uh, be a little more consistent. Cause he's had times this year where he's had stretches of really good, really good, he was been really good. I mean, you know, you look from I think it was like July, like the end of July, you know, into the beginning, into the into that twin series. I think he gave up like two runs and ten appearances. Mm -hmm. Like that was pretty darn good, right? I mean, he was pretty solid for that stretch, uh, which was almost a month. Um, yeah, but then he's also had a few stretches where he's been terrible, which was like right before and right after, you know, right after the All Star break, the last outing in Miami, and then. You know the two games against San Diego where he got crushed, but then you go back even further. Like in June, he had a dominant June where he gave up one run in the entire month. <laughs> I mean, like that. So like he's had mo he's been streaky as hell, and I, I just want to see it be a little bit more consistent. And I think that if he becomes consistent, I I am so big on bullpens and and playoffs. I, I think that they have to be on point in order for you to to win playoff series. I have I do maintain confidence in Kimbrell and Alvarado, and I'm starting to feel better about Dominguez. If Soto can just give me what he was in those good stretches this season, it doesn't matter what his ERA is. It doesn't matter what his whip is. That will be enough for me, and it will make me feel a lot better about them, especially against a team with a lineup like the Braves. Yeah, I, I'm with you on that. I know that you uh... – have, have texted me about this a couple of times, like Sir Anthony Dominguez and really feeling like, okay, he's starting to settle in. Uh, I know his last appearance against the Padres on Wednesday. I think it was a, a clean inning. I think he only threw like 11 pitches. Seven of them were strikes. It was good. Yep. It, was, it was a nice, quiet inning. Good to see. Am I being ridiculous or am I being a little bit unfair in wanting to see um, – more swing and miss stuff. Like I still, when I, when I watch him, I don't feel like I'm watching the, the high ceiling late inning guy that, that we've been accustomed to seeing at different points, uh, especially last postseason. And I, in fairness, I know that at the end of last year, it wasn't like he was on some incredible run. 
uh, like in the regular season. It kind of all clicked for me in October. And is it reasonable to think that could happen again? Maybe. But like I look at his ERA and that's fine. Like the run prevention aspect of it has been okay. But like his last 15 appearances, 15 games, he's thrown 12 and two thirds innings. He's given up 10 hits, which I think is a lot for him. And while he's only given up three earned runs, I mean, he's walked seven and he's only struck out nine. Like that's, to me, that's playing with fire. Like when I look at those numbers, I feel like he has been lucky to not be a guy holding a four, five, six ERA right now. And yeah, and so a lot of his season's been like that. Yeah, and it ha- I've not. I w- you know I was I was majorly concerned. I go back and listen to a couple episodes ago. Like I was concerned about him. Um, just because I didn't like a lot of his uh, appearances, even though he wasn't, like you said, wasn't giving up runs. But there were a lot of appearances where I was like, man, he just doesn't look right. You know, ever, ever, ever since he came back from the injury, like he just doesn't look like himself. Um, but I do look through. Like, if, you, if, if you go through these, you know, where he's been since the last time, the last time he actually gave up a run in relief was against Toronto in that 2-1 loss that, uh, that you know, one up there that we were like, oh man, there was one of the games that they should have won. Um, Dominguez gives up the run, had a bad, bad inning there. Uh, but since then, he pitched against Washington, one hit. He pitched against the Giants, one inning, one walk. He pitched against the Angels, one clean inning. Then again against the Angels. This was the one that was like, okay, this was not great, but he got out of it. Mm-hmm. Two thirds of an inning, two hits. Okay. But he got Wasn't out. That, of it. He lost that game, right? Wasn't that, that he was? He on actually the mail, got it. He allowed he got inherited the, runners to score there, did he? Not? Yeah, he, he had the blown yeah. save. One of the hits was yeah. the blown save, right? And so it ends up getting a blown save. But he came into a, a spot in that game. Let's be honest. It was, it was, yeah, there were runners. I think it was bases loaded, as a matter of fact, um, with one out, and he came in and he gave up a hit. Um, I, think he, I think he got a pop out, and then then yeah. gave up. If I yeah, I think that's game. right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but then the game in Milwaukee on the second was as good as he's looked all season yeah. three, three batters struck them all out and was dominant yep the next night against milwaukee did give up a single but he got three outs three weak contact outs and then a clean quiet inning like you said against the padres so he's had a bunch of good outings here you know minus that la blown save which is really you know he gave up a hit that with runners on base but that's it i mean so Four hits in his last seven outings. I mean, mm-hmm. that's pretty good. Yeah, the strikeouts aren't there except for that one time against Milwaukee. But I, I'm starting to feel a little bit better about where he is since he's come back from the injury in his last seven outings than I was prior to that. Yeah, I, I think that that's all fair. Um, the the one other player that it, it's just, it's kind of ironic. Like at the beginning of the season, I felt like every show we dedicated 20 minutes to Nick Castellanos. Oh and my then, god. He did a really nice job, and then we kind of just said, okay, he's good. I felt like we were – it almost felt like we were real nervous. Like, he gets off to a good start, and we're like, okay, he's all right. Like, I feel like I'm walking a kid on, like, a, a bike with, like, training wheels, and I let it go because I felt good about it. I was like, he, he's got it now, and um, he's he doesn't have it now. He's He's been pretty bad. Like, if we're being honest here, since the All-Star break, he's, he's really struggled. Uh, August – you know, got off to a I'll start. Well, he was good. If, you, if you look at the whole month of August, yeah. the whole month, really, the whole month, he hit 295 okay. in August. He hit yeah, 295 in August. It was okay. I mean, yeah. July, we know July was was all time bad. And then he, yeah. he kind of found his footing and like, that's that's good. It was uh, Tim Kelly of Phillies Nation had a tweet um, a, a few days ago and he put out every Phillies regular and it was every Phillies regular and their OPS in the second half post all-star break. And every single player was in the eight hundreds or better. And every single player had a higher second half OPS than their overall season OPS, except for one player. It was Nick Castellanos. And it's, it's sort of kind of, it, I mean, to me, it's not, it's not funny, but it's like, it, it's sort of amazing in that there's the one all-star who's, <laughs> that was selected of all these guys. And he's the one guy that's not really getting it done in the second half. I I have a feeling you and I differ on, on our view of him. I, I'm flat out concerned about him. I, I think he's been, thr- I mean, he looks lost again. He's three for 25 this month with 10 strikeouts. He hit the three double plays on four pitches the other night in San Diego. He just looks like that guy again. And like, 
I know he's a streaky hitter, and I'm sure he's got another good one in him. But like, my God, man! Like some of his at bats over the last couple of weeks here, like it just they drive me crazy. <laughs> I, I don't think we're too different, Bob. I mean, I I I think that there's a red flag there for sure, um, because and, and look, I I was on, I was on board with everything getting fixed in August. I mean, if you if you look at him, he had what that like he had a, a twelve game hit streak. Yeah, to yeah, start it was really month. good. Um, yeah. and then he and then he had, and, and then he, and then he had a nice finish to the month too. I mean, really, you know, he had uh, he had the three hit game against the Angels. He had a you know a two hit game against the Cardinals. He hit eight. What was he hit eight home runs in the month of August? I think, or maybe he had ten. He might have had ten, two, three, five, six, seven. Oh no, he had eight. I was right. Okay, he had eight home runs in August. So I mean, it was it was a good month. But yes, September has been a lot like July, and the strikeouts were you know. He struck out seven times against Milwaukee. Uh, yeah. He struck out three times against the Padres and the three double plays, right? I mean, so so like you're just killing. I mean, you're just accumulating bad outs in those games. Um, I, yeah, there's a there is a little bit of a a little bit of a worry. Um, do I like I, do I think that you're right that there is a another good run in him coming? I do. Uh, I don't think this is going to snowball into more bad Nick Castellanos. Yeah, like this isn't the, the player that, to me, went two months at the end of last year without hitting a home run. This isn't yeah. like a a guy that's going to hit 150 the remainder of the year where you're like, oh my god, can you even play him? Like I, I'm not, I'm not saying that. Yeah, I, I just he's in another one of these runs again where you're like, man, this is this is tough to watch. And I know to some degree like that's just kind of what he is, and and he probably will have that that next run where he he has seven extra base hits in four games, and you feel good about it again. But like we're we're living in a world where JT Realmuto, Trey Turner, guys that have just been you know players that have you've been down on all year, not you specifically, but people yeah. in general have been down on. Like they are now blowing by him in terms of overall productivity, like. I know it's it's a long season, 162. That's why you play them all. But man, like, you know, it's a credit to guys like Real Muto and, and Turner for for getting that spike back up. But like, you look at Nick and you go, like, man, like this guy should be, this guy should be hitting 275, 280. Like he should between the on base and slugging, like he should find a way to be up over 800. Like it just come on, like it, there should be a little bit more than this. Yeah, there absolutely should. And I'll I'll give you the one thing that I say, okay, maybe it's starting uh, slightly starting to turn around again for him. Maybe, maybe. I, I know he had the three double play game against the Padres in the, in between, but the other two games he did work some at bats. He yes, he struck out the, uh, three times in those other two games. But he had lengthier at bats. He did work a couple of walks, and that's to me what got him off to such a good start. Is he was able to have a little bit more patience, not chase so many pitches. I know a couple of those strikeouts were chases. I mean, you texted me the one where he swung at a pitch that was like, like it bounced. Like I mean, it was it was bad. It was terrible. Fifty nine yeah. and fifty nine and a half feet to the plate. yeah yeah. So I mean, you you do have still a little bit of that. But if you're able to start working walks and taking pitches, that allowed him to to see better pitches to hit. And I think that what what when I know Nick Castellanos is in trouble is when this at bat happens, and this at bat happens has been happening too frequently this month. Take strike one, foul off strike two. Now you're o two. He calls that timeout because he wants to set himself right, and then he usually takes a ball. And then he swings at a pitch out of the zone. That's the Nick Castellanos at bat that you know, like you, it, you can almost predict it. And if 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 I was a betting person, I and I, I'd be finding some kind of app that allowed me to p predict, like pitch after pitch, what was going to happen. Um, that is that's what you don't want to see. What I want to see Nick Castellanos do is either be aggressive on strike that strike one that's in the zone, go get it, right? Don't just take that first pitch strike. Or and it will do that first because then you're going to probably get some pitchers who will say, all right, well, I'm not going to put that first pitch over the over the plate. I'm going to try and get you to chase something just off. And then if you be able to recognize 
that it's just off and not swing at it and put yourself into a more favorable count. Because you look, batters are always better in favorable accounts. But and I haven't looked at this. I have no idea. But I bet if we pull up Nick Castellanos splits, that there is a sincere disparity between when he's ahead and when he's behind. Yeah, I I, I would imagine. I, you know, I kind of laughed there for a second. I let you finish your point because it was a good one, and I didn't want to get in the way of it or anything. But you know, you asked me. You were talking about being a betting man, and you said to me last night, you said, you know, where's the Where's the sharp money on this game? And to be honest with you, I was in the middle of something like pretty, pretty intense work wise. And so I just said lions. And then I, I was just thinking yeah. about, it. I was like, now when you said sharp money, did you actually mean like real, real, like professional betters? Or were you saying like, where are you betting tonight? And then I, I said to you lions. No, sharp money. <laughs> yeah, sharp, I didn't know sharp money. That's the professional betters, man. I, I know. know. I'm using I, the I terminology. I thought you were kind of just asking for my opinion, you know, like where's the sharp money at? Like where what's Bob Wankel got tonight? I gave it to you. I said lines, which I was on the side yeah. of the sharp letters as well. And, and, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. we were able to, we were able to profit off that, that opener last night. How about that game? By yeah. the way, um, it was pretty good. By the way, I just yeah. looked it up. We're just it's before okay. you give your response, Nick Castellanos, when he's behind in the count has a five fifty four OPS when he's ahead in the count, He's got a 1018 sure OPS. Yeah. And and you would and, you would have figured that for most players, but it, you're right. I mean, the, the biggest thing, the reason why he's especially bad, like look at his two strike numbers because he's yeah. been he's a victim of the strikeout more than a lot of of, of hitters yeah. are when, when he gets down 0212. And, and on first the pitch. Result, and, and, when, and when he swings first pitch, 827 OPS. Yeah. And I just don't think he swings the first pitch enough. He's uh, what he's had. Uh, how many plate appearances he had? Well, he swung at the first pitch plenty the other night in San Diego. You know, he, that, that he did. He he just, he's, only swung, that. he's only swung first pitch this season ninety-eight times. Yeah. Okay. Out of what close five eighty, whatever, however many plate appearances. I, that's just. I think he could be a little bit better than that. A little bit better. So that's what I'm saying. I want to see him attack first pitch fastballs in the strike zone. And I want to, and then obviously you want to see him be ahead in the count. So if you attack those first pitch fastballs, you eventually get pitchers to say, okay, well, we're not going to throw you pitches in the zone. So then you get ahead in the count and then you can do your damage, which is when he's done his best damage this year. A 10 18 OPS is pretty damn good if you rank that in comparison to other players when you're ahead in the count. As a matter of fact, it even, if you go his, uh, his SOPS plus, which is comparative to the league average. When he's ahead is 108. So he's eight he's eight percent better than the average player when he's ahead in the count. So we gotta talk about before we get out of here, and this is the last thing that I have on my list, and then yeah. we can do one last thing. But we yeah. we got to talk about Kyle Schwarber. And the conversation is is he a leadoff hitter? Is he not? I don't know anymore. And and I don't I don't care. Like it works. You and I agree on that that it works. Yeah. But we've talked a lot about like the counting stats and like, oh, he's on pace for, uh, you know, 105 runs batted in. He's on pace to hit 48 home runs. Like, that's all fine and well. Another interesting note is not only did he pass Jimmy Rollins for the single season uh, franchise record and leadoff home runs with his 10th the other day, but he's also on pace to break Lenny Dykstra's single season walk record of 129 mm -hmm. back in 1993. Like, he's on pace right now for 131 walks this season. And like we can, we always, when we talk about Kyle Schwarber, it's about the batting average and it's about the home runs and you live with the good and you, you have to deal with the bad, but like, here's something that's different about what's going on with him right now. Like, it's not just about how he fits in the Phillies lineup. It's about what he's doing against the rest of the league and like how he stacks up against the rest of baseball. Like, let me just throw out a couple quick numbers for you here, but in 49 games since the all-star break, he's hit 17 home runs. That's first. He's walked more than anyone else. He has 41 runs batted in, fifth. Has a 976 OPS, 976, 11th. He's got a 400 on base percentage since the All-Star break. That's 11th best in all of baseball. Pretty damn good, man. Yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, I, I did this. Uh, I've been having, again, I keep going back and forth with a lot of people on, on Schwarber because there's it amazes me just how many people are um are, are still up opposed to him being where he is and in the lineup and and what his value is to this team 
So I yesterday I did this. I, I played this uh, game in a group chat. I said, and you're going to know right away who player A is, but player A has 98 hits, 112 walks this season, meaning he's reached base 210 times in 623 plate appearances. Okay. Player B has 154 hits, 58 walks, meaning he's reached base 212 times in 625 plate appearances. So almost identical as far as reaching base. Almost identical. Two more plate appearances for player B, two more times on base. But almost, otherwise, almost identical. And I asked two questions. Question one, are these guys leadoff hitters? And question two, who are the players? But we know player A is Kyle Schwarber, right? Who do you think player B is? I don't know. Hit me with it. <laughs> 2008 Jimmy Rollins. <laughs> uh, that's great. He's got almost identical on-base numbers to Jimmy Rollins in 2008. And he's hit 41 home runs. So to sit there and question the value of Kyle Schwarber, whether you're going to say as a leadoff guy or even on the roster, like, like in the lineup anywhere, it, yes, it doesn't make sense in your head because you're used to baseball being leadoff guy is a much better hitter than a 193 or whatever the hell he's hitting yeah. hitter. But he is as productive, if not more so, than Jimmy Rollins was on your world championship Phillies team. It's 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 interesting. So not only does he have the 400 on base percentage since the All-Star break, but for the season, it's 345 now after this yeah. run that he's been on. And when you look at against the, the rest of the league, that's top 40 in baseball. Like, is it mm -hmm. elite? No, but it, it stacks up. Like, 345 on base percentage is justifiable in the leadoff spot. Even Very if, much so. Even if, like, you're just talking about, like, okay, I don't love, uh, like, I don't love the fact that we're wasting his power in the leadoff spot. Or, you know, like, I, I understand his value as a player, but I still wouldn't hit him there. Like, I would point to the, the on base percentage and say, like, that is enough to, to keep him there. And, you know, one other thing, like we keep talking about the sub 200 batting average. I mean, the, we're not saying the guy's Tony Gwynn here or anything, but for the last 30 games, he's hitting 245. Like, so even that has become a little bit more, you know, palatable. Like, it, it's not, he's not hitting 300, he's not hitting 350, but like 245, you'll take that, especially when it comes with the power and the walks that, that he's producing. And again, like, I always will go back to OPS. I think it's a hundredth time I said that phrase on this show today, but like, 1.091 OPS is the last 30 games. That's awesome. Let me ask you this. Do you think there's any correlation to the fact that he, he's been this much better since he's not had to play left field every day? <laughs> I think that there's a very strong correlation. <laughs> uh, yes, I do. I, I don't think that there's yeah. any mystery that him not being on his feet every day when I think very clearly, again, all speculation here, total speculation – I think he was very much dealing with some type of lower body injury for the, much of this season. And so the fact that he hasn't had to play left field six days a week, I, I think it's had a significant impact on him. I do. And so, so it, I think it, it shows that even though, you know, cause you can look ahead and you're like, Oh man, you know, Kyle Schwarber's hitting 190, whatever. Uh, and you can't play in the field and we have him under contract for another two years. I think you look ahead and say, Okay, two years, two more years of this is okay. Like as, as a DH, like this yeah, is, we'll go this back like five or six weeks ago. I think I asked you the question, like yeah, he's gonna hit forty plus home runs, and like that's great, and like I know he walks, but can the Phillies like really bring him back? Like, would you look to maybe move that contract if there was a team that was like, yeah, you know what, we need the power, we'll do it? Because I mean, he was a bad baseball player for for a lot of the season, and I mean, when I say that, I mean in just in terms of yeah, the strikeouts were crazy. The, the, the power production was good, but it wasn't as as consistent, and he wasn't drawing as many walks as he is in the stretch here. Like, he's just taking it up a notch, and, like, you can live with this for sure. I mean, it goes without saying. But, like, you're talking about a guy for a lot of the season who had, like, a, you know, 760, 770 OPS. Well, now he's sitting in the 820s. Maybe he ends up in the 830s, 40s. Like, that's a totally different offensive player. Um, I, I will get to this eventually. Like, I still don't know – how this roster works next year. I do still think that there's going to be a, a big piece that moves here, but we'll, we'll save that for another day. Um, but yeah, man, like that's where I start to look at this team and I go October, October, October. And I just look at the way that he's locking in right now. It's not just about the month of June anymore. Um, 
and you start to see Turner turn it on. You start to see Harper turn it on. I know he struggled in on that road trip. You still feel really good about where he's at. Like this team, man, like they got a puncher's chance. I will, I will say that. Yeah, I agree. I still agree. Um, I have one more Phillies thing before we get to one last thing. Sure. And I think this is this is I wanted to get to this because I think it follows up on something we talked about last episode. And it's and that's kind of a look ahead. But I sent you a, a story that Todd Zalecki did the other day um, on MLB.com where it was an update on the Phillies' top five prospects. And he actually got a, had an opportunity to talk to Dave Dombrowski and get a couple quotes from him. And one of the quotes from Dombrowski, I'm just going to read it because I think it was it was a very telling quote. Because um, we were talking a little bit about the Phillies' rotation – and, you know, obviously uh, for, ne- for next season, you know, Andrew Painter is not going to pitch in 24. We know that. Um, and it sounded like Mick Abel and Griff McGarry have kind of hit a little bit of a wall with development um, at the end of the season here. So he was asked, you know, what, what are they options to compete for jobs next spring? And here's what Dombrowski said. I mean, we still have some time to play, so I'll hold my judgment. But based upon what we know so far, I'd say I don't think that I'd count on them. If they came in next spring, it would be a pleasant surprise. But I think guys like that, once they put it together, they can come very quickly. But I also would say I'm also not counting on them being in our rotation for the beginning of next season. <laughs> how, how do you how do you now view what the Phillies are going to look like in the beginning of 23 in your starting rotation? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, you have Zach Wheeler. I guess you have Christopher Sanchez. You're, and Ranger. You have Ranger, and you're paying Taiwan Walker. Yeah. Um, so, uh, And then I don't know. I mean, listen, I, here's the only thing I'll say. Like, Mick Abel on August 16th went out, and he pitched five innings against the Somerset Patriots, and he gave up eight earned runs. This is six hits, two walks. They all scored. He gave up four home runs in that start. It was a disaster. There's three starts since then, though. He's pitched 18 innings. He's only allowed two earned runs. He's only allowed uh, 10 total hits. And, you know, he struck out 15. Like, you know, I'm looking at that and I'm going, hey, that's, that's pretty good. Like, he's really been pretty pretty good here his last three starts. But, obviously, they look at the entire picture and they haven't been – I mean, listen, there's a lot of different ways. You say, what does it mean for the Phillies rotation? What does it mean for Mick Abel? Like, because to me, for the, the president of baseball operations to come out on the first week of September – with an entire offseason and winter in front of you, and basically saying, like, no, I wouldn't count on him. Like, what what message is that sending about how he or that front office views Mick Abel at this point? I mean, holy shit. Yeah. And, and you McGarry, and McGarry, too. I mean, who was a little bit less, obviously, of a prospect. I mean, Dude, can still... I tell you, like, I've never really seen it with him. Like, I understand, like, the arm and all, but, like, yeah. I just don't – I don't look at him and say, here's a guy that I can count on 30 starts a year to give me six innings. Like, I just – I don't think he's that guy. Uh, they shut him down. They shut him down for a year yeah. in AAA. He was getting pummeled in AAA, and they moved him onto that development list mm-hmm. where he pitches, but not in games. Like right. he just pitches off on, you know, in in you know, intramural basically is what it is. I mean, well, that's not a guy term. that that you feel like, hey, he's on the brink. But with Abel, I'm like, I don't know. I mean, like, the, yeah. Now. I will say his arguably one of his best starts of the season came in his, his last outing. It was the day that that's story published yeah. he went six innings. He only allowed one hit two walks, seven strikeouts. Like maybe he uses that as fuel. Maybe he says, you know what? Like I'll show you, but like that had to be, I, I find that commentary to be somewhat calculated. Like, yes. Like not only are, is, is Dave Dombrowski setting the expectation that, that the Phillies are probably going to have to go out and do something creative this off season, whether it be spend, whether it be spend to retain Aaron Nola, whether it be a trade, what have you. But man, like I, I can't imagine that he didn't make that those comments without some type of motivating factor in the back of his mind in, in saying it. Yeah, no, that's, I agree. I agree. I just thought that there was. Uh, I thought it was very interesting that he came out and said it when he said it. I thought that it's the funny, timing like, of it was. Yeah, it, it's just funny. Like so, Mick Abel is is twenty two years old. He just turned twenty two in the middle yeah. of August. So he's a young guy, and there's been some good with him. And like I think you can still feel like that he's a legit prospect, a guy that maybe can be, you know, a number two, number three type starter for you. But like, can the Phillies just get one of these kids? 
at like 19, 20, and him just be up at, you know, 22 and just awesome. Like we thought we were, we thought maybe we would get it with him this year, maybe next year. With Painter, we thought we would get it this year. And like it just has not happened. <laughs> yeah, are, are we going to be reading something in the Inquirer five years from now that's like, you know, a look back at the McGarry Abel Painter trio? It was supposed to be the next big thing. And between the three of them, they pitched a combined 19 innings for the Phillies. Like, <laughs> I, I really hope that we're not doing that. I th- yeah. Didn't we see that with the uh, baby aces back in uh, like the 2010, like around then? All those yeah. guys, like Jared Kosart and those dudes. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Well, hey, right, well it, let's get it to one last it. thing. If I had to say to you, Bob, what what is your thought on the Phillies core? Just saying it that way, the core of this team. Where where do you think they are in the league? Like if you just take the core players and say this core versus the other 29 teams in baseball, where are, where do you put the Phillies? Well, when you say core, do you mean like their best players or do you mean their normal starters? Well, their core being their best players who are going to be here for a few seasons. Yeah, right? so you got like Harper right over 30, Schwarber's right over 30, Castellanos in the same range, Real Muto's a little older. Turner. Turner right there. I mean, they're all like, they're all basically right on that 30-31 threshold, so... I would say that that probably puts you in the middle of the pack. I think you're setting me up, though, to say that they're comparatively young. So go ahead. <laughs> no, I wasn't going to say that at all. I, I, you actually are going to go probably against uh, my thought process here. I mean, yeah, right? and you got, I, I, if you look at, I, I guess they have a few young players too. I mean, you got to you got to sit there and say, I mean, I'm I'm assuming Bohm is part of the core and Marsh is part of the core. Sure. Okay, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And and yeah, so those guys are probably there as well. Um, Stott, obviously. The ESPN put out a... They do this every year. Every September, they put out a ranking of the core. Okay? Last year, they had the Phillies ranked eighth. Okay? Based off of their core that they had in place last year. Then you go out and you add Trey Turner. Mm-hmm. And you get a couple of... You know, you get the improvements out of the out of Stott, Bo Marsh. Yep. Right? Um, and you know, even if you look at a, even if you look at a, a, maybe a young up and coming player, who's gotten a little bit of time, like a Rojas, for example, let's sure. just say, right. You know, and, and, you know, who knows if you look at where you look at how you view Sanchez, maybe you view him as a two war type of player, right? I mean, that's, that's a decent, solid player, right? So, you know, you add that to your core. Would you think that you'd at least stay at eight? If not, just with the Turner edition alone, maybe go up higher, Right. This year, they have them ranked 15th in baseball. Obviously, Braves are number one, right? Just no, look, you got just the talent out the wazoo sure. with the Braves. All right, and Dodgers are two. That's no surprise. Then it goes, I'm just going to read off the teams down, down to the Phillies. Three is Seattle. Four, Texas. Five, Houston. Six is... Uh, what did I miss? Oh, Baltimore, which I think is my, probably a little low. I think they could be a little for them. Uh, maybe yeah. that's they just have more coming. But yeah. yeah, seven Tampa, eight St. Louis, nine uh-huh. Cleveland, <laughs> ten the Mets, ten the Mets, <laughs> eleven San Diego, twelve the Yankees, thirteen Arizona. Which okay, fine. Toronto 14 and then the Phillies. I I was yeah, I don't know. I mean, casted by this. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I know the intricacies of all of those other organizations. The Yankees are interesting. I, I think that you would have ranked them probably 19th 2 weeks yeah. ago, but then they've brought up some kids that have given them a little bit of a lift and so I guess everyone like like they always do kind of overhypes what they got out there. But um you know, yeah, I mean, look, you add Trey Turner and you you have a better Bryson Stott than you, you had a year ago. You have a better Alec Boom than you had a year ago. Um, I, I guess, like, if I'm playing devil's advocate, Harper has had injury issues. Real Muto is not the same player this year that he's been, uh, though I don't think he's as bad as people seem to think he is. You know, Schwarber is, is – unable to play defense for you we know like we know the limitations there nick castellanos is another three years of like who knows 
who knows what this even is, right? Like you yeah. don't even know what that might look like. If you told me Nick Castellanos finished next year in the top 15 of M MVL- uh, or top 10 of MVP voting, I, I don't think I'd be surprised. And if you told me that he hit 207, I, I don't think I'd be surprised. So nothing would surprise me there. Um, yeah, I mean, like, listen, I, I kind of would think that the Phillies would be like a, a, a in that eight to ten range, you know, a, against some of these other teams. Like, they're a team next year that should still be a postseason team. Like, just look at it that way. Yeah. Like, you know, you get six in each league. They're, they're not they're not one of the twelve best cores right now. They'll they'll made the postseason two years in a row. After this year, they will be favored to do it again next year. It's it's surprising to hear that. Yeah, and and just so just to kind of give you one other little nugget on this, not that, not that I want to really, you know, play up an ESPN. Who, story. who wrote this? Was it, who was this? Kylie McDonald. Kylie McDonald. Who's like the is like their you know their prospecty kind of yeah. person, right? Okay. So the the what he did is is he said he broke them into tiers. So he split them into elite tier, which is a five plus WAR talent or MVP candidate, an above average tier, which is a three to five WAR kind of player and a solid tier which is one and a half to three war okay that's how they split them up so who do you think that is is in the phillies elite tier harper no okay (laughs) immediately that was that that was the thing i'm like how is bryce harper not in the elite we're not we're saying next year bryce harper fully healthy coming into a year would not be an elite tier as a, a wins above replacement player i mean seriously Seriously, that's what I, that's why I had a problem with it. The only huh. one that they put in the elite tier was Turner. Is that just because they they don't find his defense to be useful? Is it is that sucking him? It down doesn't. It, there's no we explanation. About offensive game. I mean, what are we doing? There's a. It, it doesn't. There's and they're the only like each team gets like the, who the players are in their tiers, and then there's like a little blurb at the bottom of it. But it doesn't even talk. And about this includes this includes pitching too. Yeah. It's a Wheeler. No. I mean, come on, man. What are we talking about? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you talk about, like, Fangraph's war right now, this season. Zach Wheeler leads every pitcher in Fangraph's war. Wheeler isn't even considered in his core, in their core. Is That's it just because he has thing. one year left and he's a couple of I, years? I don't know. Like, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what he has as their core. Turner is, the, is in the elite level. the only one in the elite yeah. level. Above average, which is your three to fives, he's got Real Muto, Harper, Stott, Marsh. Okay. Okay. Marsh surprised me a little bit in that one, but that's okay. Uh, solid tier, which is your one and a half to three war. Uh, he put Painter in that list, which is a little bit of a surprise. And Abel, both. But Bone. Does he give you a time frame of like the next three years, the next four years? Like, is there like you, a. I'm going to go back and read the very beginning of this and just. Because to like see if where... you told me, like, if you told me that, yeah, like, listen, this is a four year run that he's. If this was about 2024, I'd say that's insane. And I would immediately just okay. close the article. So here's why Wheeler is not included because when he's doing the rankings, he's only including players who are under contractual control through 2025. Okay. Okay, so Wheeler's uh, Wheeler's up at 24, so that's why Wheeler's not included. Okay, so there's the reason that he's not there. Age isn't a factor, but he'll round up or down on projecting young players and vice versa on older players as he's projecting and ranking teams looking for a two-plus year time frame. So you're looking at something that's through 25. That's why I'm perplexed by this being 15. All right, so that's what – but that I missed that part about – the, the players are under control through 25. So that's why Wheeler's not on the list. But it's okay. That's your above average. Solids are Painter, Bohm, Walker, Schwarber, Abel, Castellanos, Rojas, Suarez, Alvarado, Soto, Sosa, Sanchez, Dominguez. Well, I mean, we'll see. You know, I, I'm, trying, I'm trying to separate myself from like the this isn't a, a true power ranking, it's just a what do you got for the next couple of years? And, and the reason why this exercise, though, it's interesting. And like, I mean, yeah, it's, it, it's an interesting talking point too. The reason why I kind of go, okay, is because you know that these cores change and you know, that teams that spend will try to fix these issues. If they, they, they deem them actual issues. I just look at it and go like, okay, okay. Sounds good. Kylie. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, so bulletin board material for the Phillies. Yeah. You're not good enough to be. You're middle of the pack the next couple yeah. of years. Yeah. Do you ever do you ever feel 
and this is such a Philadelphia fan thing to say, but I, I, I do find this with the Phillies a little bit from a national perspective. B- baseball hates the Phillies. I don't think that they hate them, but I think that they don't think they're nearly as good as as people here think they are. Yeah. yeah. I think that they kind of downplay what the Phillies are. And I don't know why. I don't know. What do they have to do more? I mean, they went to the World Series last year. They're back. going to be back in the playoffs this year. Do they have to go on another World Series run to make make people say, hey, maybe that team's better than we give them credit for? I just think that the way the game's played, you, there's certain things that teams prioritize. There's certain things that the industry prioritizes. Um, these these I- industry people, like, they love – and I mean, like, I'm not saying that this is wrong either, but, like, they love player development. They love the farm system. They love blue-chip prospects. They, they love defense. They love, you know – and the Phillies aren't any of those things. And they continue to not be able to, you know, not that they, they don't bring up players that help them like a guy like Rojas and like, they have some homegrown talent like Stott and like these guys, these are real things like boom, these are real players, but they, they don't, they haven't done it the way that, that the elite teams that everyone fawns over like Tampa Bay, you know, does it. It's spend money, plug holes, you know, Try to outbop your way uh, past your your defensive efficiencies and the intellectual, the IQ things that they they lack. Like that's why the fa- that's why the sport I don't think thinks as highly of the Phillies. And, and this is why I think maybe being more, even though I I do like to use some modern statistical analytics when discussing baseball because I think baseball is the one sport that allows for that to really be something tangible that you can that you can use. Um, I, I am more old school in my in my thought process of I don't ever want to be bad. So I, I, I want to try and win whenever I can and however I can. And it, at some point, you you have to realize that you can't and, and you have to start doing things to be better next year. Right. But at the same point, I, I want to be that guy, that kind of team that goes for it. You know, and if you have an owner willing to spend the money to go for it, then go for it. And so. That's why I think that the Phillies are are far more likable than the the notion of let's take seven years to get good and then we'll be good for a, for a period of time. Right. Like I, I don't I don't know. Is this the Houston Astro model? Is that what everybody wants to be the Astros? I mean, you mentioned the Rays, but what the hell have they done? I know. What I know. Won? I mean, hey, listen, won, I get they haven't it. won shit. I know. Right. What have they done? Totally so like, understand. I'd rather be the Phillies than any of those teams. Yeah. I, I just me personally, you know, and I think that there's a couple of other teams that kind of had that mentality. You know, uh, look, the Dodgers develop guys and they spend money like that's probably your ideal situation, right? right? You have an ownership group that's willing to spend all that money and we develop players really well. And that's why we're top of the division year in and year out. Right. Um, but uh, look, I I give teams credit when they're going out and spend like, like as much as we laugh at the Mets. They've they've just done it wrong, but I give them credit for every year we're going to try and win because we're going to go out and spend Uncle Stevie's money, right? <laughs> I give them credit for right. that. I think that they screw it up. I think they have the wrong people in charge and they're bringing in the wrong people, but I give them credit for the ideology. Yeah. So no, I don't know. I'm just that. I'm just that way. Texas. There's another one. Like I think the Rangers. Right. Same thing. Give them bad credit. week for the Rangers. Bad week for the Rangers. Yeah, My goodness. Rangers. They're in trouble. They're in a lot of trouble. The yeah, Astros went you know. in there and scored about 94 runs on them in three games. So Yeah, yeah. All yeah. right, well, that will do it for the latest episode of Cross Stuff for Anthony Sam with Filippo. I am Bob Wankel. We'll be back on Monday morning. You can follow Anthony on Twitter at Ian Sam Philly. Follow the show at Bob underscore Wankel. And you can follow uh, me at uh, – I'm sorry, follow the show account at Up Phillies. My goodness, it's been a long day already. It's – it's the morning, and I feel like uh, I've been working for about 15 hours right now. All right, we'll uh, we'll talk to you. Hey, uh, don't forget, don't forget uh, to mention your newsletter, Bob. Oh yeah, we got the newsletter. Yeah, make sure that you're checking that out. Uh, RedOctoberPhilly.com uh, uh, slash subscribe. You can check that out. Uh, appreciate it if you do. It comes to your mailbox Monday through Friday, uh, sometime between eight and ten every morning, depending on uh, depending on how the kids are each morning. You know what I mean? So yeah, exactly. That kind of dictates the time that that goes out. All right. Well, thank you for listening and we will talk to you soon.